This video was brought to you by the Teaching Center, UF's Learning Support Center, and the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. This is number 10 from Dr. Long's study guide. So we're looking at the sequence, right? The sequence of this newly discovered uh, transmembrane protein, or just membrane protein, right? And we have all these hydrophobic, we have these hydrophobic sequences, all these hydrophobic amino acids. But in between these hydrophobic segments, we have is aspartame residue, which is positively charged. We have some more hydrophobic and then another aspartame residue. And now it's theorized that this protein functions to transfer molecules across the membrane. So why do we have these aspartame residues? What, what do they do? All right, so think about this. If we have a transmembrane helix or something inside the membrane, right, it needs to have these hydrophobic regions to, to stay in the membrane. So you have this here, you have these hydrophobic sections that here to interact with the membrane to keep it, to keep it bound. But if we have polar molecules, right, so we have all these different kinds of charged molecules that we want to get inside the membrane, uh, they won't be able to interact with these hydrophobic regions, which means that we need these aspartame residues, or anything that's charged, uh, to be able to interact with those and pull them through. So in this case, it happens to be aspartame residues with this positively charged interior, so it forms uh, like a ring, where it's positive, it has this hydro, uh, hydrophilic interior by hydrophobic exterior, so it interacts with the membrane on the exterior and these polar molecules on the interior, allowing them to come in. Uh, what's one way we can test this? Well, we can mutate these aspartame residues so that they are no longer polar, which means they won't be able to interact with this polar molecule, which means it'll no longer function. And that's one way to test whether or not this is actually what the aspartame residues are doing. Alright, this is number 11 from Dr. Long's study guide. So we're looking at a membrane protein again, and we have this hydrophilic sequence uh, containing lysines and arginines uh, right next to the N-terminus. So we have our N-terminus here, and we have these arginines and lysines, which you may remember, or you should remember, are positively charged, followed by uh, six transmembrane helices. Are we particularly going to, uh, we'll start that over. This is the Dr. Long study guide, uh, number 11. So we're looking at another membrane protein. And we have this hydrophilic sequence containing several lysines and arginines uh, next to the N-terminus. So here's our N-terminus. And arginines and lysines have this positive charge, followed by uh, a few hydrophobic regions, six, yeah, six, transmembrane, six transmembrane helices. So six transmembrane regions. And we want to see which side the N-terminus and which side the C-terminus will fall on, which side of the membrane. Well, if it has these positive charges right next to the N-terminus, these positive charges indicate that it's going to go on the inside. Just because uh, when, the, when the cell inserts a membrane protein, they usually have a positive sequence followed by this hydrophobic sequence, which will serve as the transmembrane region. Uh, and it's just how the cell recognizes that this goes on the inside, so you don't get them mixed up. Well, that's all that's getting mixed up. All right, so here's our membrane. This is going to be the inside. We've determined that. So N-terminus is on the inside. We have six transmembrane helices. So we have this first one, followed by a second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. And this is the end. We're going to have our carboxylic acid. Uh, so then this terminus, the carboxylic acid terminus, will be on the inside as well. Now, this is just what we're thinking, what we're hypothesizing. How can we exper experimentally determine this? Well, we can treat this with proteases, right? So a protease is an enzyme that cleaves proteins. This is all protein, and this will all be cleaved. And then you can take this, analyze what's been cleaved, and figure out uh, the, different, the different sequences. And if we don't find the N-terminus, which we expect not to because it's on the inside of the cell, which means we can be protected from the protease by the cell membrane, uh, we're going to have a negative result. number 14 from Dr. Long's study guide. So at pH of 7, this molecule, indole, is able to cross the, are able to, yeah, sort of over. Number 14, the Dr. Long's study guide. We'll do that one more time, all right, this time we we'll do it for sure. Hey guys, this is number 14 from Dr. Long's study guide. So at pH of 7, this molecule, indole, is able to Cross the membrane, uh, the maybe not. I just keep, keep it in time. I'm here. A little bit wild there. Say that. Okay. There you go. 
is number 14 from Dr. Link's study guide. So at pH of 7, tryptophan presses a lipid bilayer about 1 1,000th the rate of this molecule, indole. Uh, I may explain why. All right, well, first of all, let's look at, at this molecule. Well, we see that they're, it's pretty stable. It uh, has these aromatic rings, and it's hydrophobic, right? So it's able to interact pretty well with the hydrophobic regions of the membrane, and it's very small, so it's able to pass through. Tryptophan, on the other hand, at least at a pH of 7, right, is also very small. But remember, it has this amino and carboxylic acid moiety. Now, this is relatively basic, so it's going to be positively charged at, at a uh, neutral pH. And this is acidic, so it's going to be negatively charged at a neutral pH. So we have this, these uh, positive and negative charges, which are going to make it more hydrophilic and not quite as, um, it won't be able to interact as easily with the lipids in the membrane, which is going to prevent it from being able to diffuse into the cell. This is number 15 from Dr. Long's study guide. So we have this lipid flip base, right, in our membrane, and it's maintaining a gradient of phosphatidylserine, which is negatively charged on the inside. So this is kind of the same concept of having this transmembrane protein taking an ion, say sodium, from the outside and pumping it into the cell against this gradient. And that's going to require energy. But how much energy, which is what we need to find out, um, will be determined using this equation. Delta G, which is our GIF's free energy, the energy we need for this equation to go, or this reaction to go, is R, the gas constant, multiplied by the temperature, ln of K, or C2 over C1, plus the charge of the species that's being transported, multiplied by Faraday's constant, multiplied by the difference in potential uh, across the membrane. So, for the first part of the question, it's just asking us uh, to solve it as if there's no difference in potential across the membrane, which means this value will be zero, so we can ignore this section of the equation. This section right here, delta G equals RT, ln of K, that's derived from uh, your equilibrium values, the K values you get from Gen Chem 1, and your, your gas loss, PV equals NRT. So this is actually the gas constant, 8.315, I don't believe you have to memorize that or really have to know that, but it's there for you. Uh, the temperature and ln of K, so it's like the equilibrium. We have C2, which is one side, versus C1, which is the beginning. Remember, we have, uh, so it's like C1, C2. We have this kind of thing going on, and it exists in a certain equilibrium. Well, in this case, it's maintaining an equilibrium of, of 1 million. All right, if this helps, you know, it's there for you. If it doesn't help, just forget it. Remember what you do is you take the, an easy way to just remember this is that you take the gradient and ln that, plug it into this equation. All right, so ln of one million. Uh, so to solve delta G, for this first part, we just take R is 8.315, multiplied by the temperature it gives us, which is 310 Kelvin, okay? Multiplied by the natural log of one million. And if you just plug that into your calculator, you should get something about 35.6 kilojoules per mole. And these are the units that it works out to. Now, for the second part of the equation, we're going to have to calculate in the fact that there is a difference in potential between the outside and the inside of the membrane. So it gives us that the, the difference in potential, which is this segment of the equation, is going to be 50 millivolts. I don't know if you guys can see that. 50 millivolts, uh, which is not, so you don't put 50 in here because it's millivolts, it needs to be in volts. So you, you take that uh, to be 0 0.05 volts, which we're going to plug into here, multiply it by Z, which is the charge of the species, in this case it's going to be 1, because it gives us the charge of uh, phosphatidylserine is negative 1, if we're like calcium it would be 2, because calcium ion is, is plus 2, uh, and Faraday's constant, which is 96,480 approximately. So we have this section, right? Uh, this is the same, but we're going to add 1 multiplied by Faraday's constant, 96,480 multiplied by 0 0.05 volts, 
So this value that we already got, 35.6 kilojoules, plus Faraday's constant multiplied by 0 0.05 should come out to around 40.4 kilojoules per mole. All right? And you get that just plug in your calculator. Figure it that way. Remember, it's important to understand what each one of these values represents. All right? And that's number 15.